Uh, okay, so today we're going to talk about the distorted Fourier transform. Okay, so in order to motivate, uh, you know, this topic, uh, let's let's recall how we dealt with the stability of zero problem. Well, to deal with the stability of zero problem, we looked at the linearized uh, problem around zero, and the linearized problem around zero is just the flat Schrodinger equation. So that's around zero. And that's for NLS, but obviously for KDV, you know, you, you take the uh, area equation. Okay, so now uh, what if you want to linearize around a soliton psi? So you linearize around a soliton psi. Uh, then what's going to come out is actually something a bit complicated. Uh, so let me write, this is the uh, problem we will study, but the actual problem you want to study if you linearize around the soliton psi uh, also involves a term with a u bar, uh, which, which uh, you know, complicates things further. So uh, for us, we'll be happy with studying this case, you know, which has all the uh, sort of uh, conceptual um, questions coming up, but which saves a bit of the uh, technical difficulties. So these are the linearized problems around zero and around the soliton. So around zero, what did we 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 used two things. First, we used uh, decay estimates or strikeout estimates. And, and second, we used uh, the fact that, if you remember, for the cubic uh, Schrodinger equation, we used the representation of the solution in Fourier space, which ultimately is linked to the fact that the Fourier transform diagonalizes the uh, Laplacian. So in other words, if I take dx squared f hat of xi, this is minus xi squared f hat of xi, as, uh, as we all know, right? So in other words, uh, if you conjugate multiplication by xi squared with the Fourier transform, what you get is the Laplacian. So in other words, taking the Fourier transform provides a basis in which uh, the Laplacian operator is uh, diagonal. And so we'd like to get these two same um, elements. So what decay or strikeout estimates on the one hand and uh, a diagonal basis on the other for this new uh, linear problem. Um, and the key element in, in getting that is, is the distorted Fourier transform. And I should say, uh, it's, it's also called the uh, vile uh, Kodaira Titchmarsh theory. So it's just the, the theory of uh, one dimensional uh, Schrodinger operators. And, um, and it, it's, it, it can be generalized in a rather straightforward way to um, storm mobile operators. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Uh, let's, let's, let's do it, unless you have any question.
Okay, so uh, what we are after is uh, diagonalizing the uh, one-dimensional Schrodinger operator. Uh, so, so <clears throat> which of course is, is self-adjoint. If, if you uh, if you have the right uh, functional uh, setup, so so that's if you want a, a particular case of the spectral theorem. So the spectral theorem. Let's uh, review a few things about the spectral theorem. Okay. So in finite dimension, in finite dimension finite dimension <coughs> uh, if you take M a real symmetric matrix you can write it as M is the sum of J equals 1 to D of the lambda J uh, Ej cross Ej, so that's just the projector on the uh, vector Ej multiplied by the vector Ej. So here Ej is an orthonormal basis, orthonormal basis, and lambda J are uh, real numbers. Okay, so we all know that from our undergraduate years. So now uh, let's let's move on to infinite dimension. So in infinite dimension, uh, the easier case, so dimension D equals infinity, the e easier case is when you have only discrete spectrum. And that's the case, for instance, if M is compact. So M is a compact operator on a, a Hilbert space, which is self-adjoint. Then you can also write M as the sum, this time the sum goes to infinity, uh, and the lambda j, the only difference is that now they go to zero as j goes to infinity. Okay, so we want something <coughs> uh, yet more general. We want an operator that is infinite dimensional, but that is not compact. If you think of the Schrodinger operator, it's uh, certainly not going to be compact on, on L2. So what's, what's the general version of the spectral theorem we'll use? Uh, let me state it now. Yes. Um, do you use that the operator is self-joint? Because otherwise it's not really clear to me. So I think the general case is meaning that it's singular values, but you have to put them into a... That's right, yes. It is It is self-joint, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you assume it's a self-joint combination. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, Okay, so right. So how about in the in the general case? So now we take M. So uh, now general case. General case. So M is a 
possibly unbounded self joint uh, operator on a Hilbert space. Uh, then one way of stating the uh, spectral theorem is that M can be written as the integral of lambda d e lambda. Uh, the integral is over R. And these are a projection or this is a projection valued measure. Uh, in other words, the integral between a and b of d e lambda is e b minus e a, where these things are uh, projections. Okay, so uh, of course here uh, there is much that I'm leaving under the carpet. Uh, you know, what is an unbounded operator, what is a self joint operator, and how to make proper sense of, of this uh, rather f f formal uh, equality. Uh, but I, I think we can manipulate these things as though everything was working, uh, you know, reasonably. And then I if you want to know more, you can, you can open a, a textbook on uh, spectral theory uh, like the book by uh, uh, Gerhard Teschel is, is really very nice and it covers all these things, including uh, one-dimensional Schrodinger operators. Um, okay, so, so in a way, uh, this uh, theorem uh, sort of answers the question, if you take M to be uh, the uh, Schrodinger operator that we're interested in, so m is minus dx squared plus v, uh, then, you know, this gives an, an appropriate way of uh, diagonalizing the operator. Of course, I should insist that this is the analog of, of what we wrote earlier. So earlier, the integral was uh, replaced by a sum, but there was always real numbers and projections. And the fact that we need an integral has to do with the possible presence of continuous spectrum. Okay, so in a way this answers the problem, but uh, sort of this, this, this doesn't tell us anything about what these projections are and how we can effectively uh, compute them. Uh, so uh, it's also important to uh, have a statement about you know, how these uh, projection operators arise, which is part of, of the proof of this, of this theorem. So the way to define these projection operators is to go through the resolvent, so the resolvent R is uh, R of C, M minus C inverse if the real part of C is not zero then this is a bounded operator because M is a self joint okay and then Stone's formula gives you a means of uh, computing uh, the uh, projection valued measure So it's saying that d e lambda, or maybe I should denote it, uh, uh, yeah, d e lambda is good, d e lambda is 1 over 2 pi i, r of lambda plus i0 minus r of lambda minus i0. And so here, uh, so this should be understood as the limit as epsilon goes to zero of r of lambda plus i epsilon. And if you have minus, minus i epsilon. 
so w once again, part of the theorem is that uh, you know this this makes sense and this does define a uh, projection, and and maybe you know the, the 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 way to make sense of this equality is to integrate both sides. So if I integrate this between a and b. Uh, I get the integral between a and b of this. Okay, so Stone's formula gives us a means of computing the uh, spectral resolution of the operator m. And, and now our program is going to be uh, to apply this to uh, Schrodinger operators and see uh, what what the uh, projection uh, projections look like? Okay. Sorry, I have one small question. Yeah. In the definition for result, you just said that you want the real point of sight of the non zero. Yes. But I think you mean the imaginary part, right? Because M is self absorbent. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's the imaginary part of C, which is the non zero, right? So. Roughly speaking, M has, uh, or at least uh, heuristically, M has a real spectrum. So as long as C doesn't have zero imaginary part, it's not in the spectrum and, and therefore everything is fine. Thank you. Okay, so, so, so now we're going to try and apply uh, this uh, idea to Schrodinger operators. Okay, so, so now we want to apply uh, Stone's formula. to a Schrodinger operator of the form minus dx squared plus v. Okay, so uh, we need to find the resolvent. So the resolvent uh, will be denoted r sub v of c. And so it's a, it's a linear operator. So we can represent it through its kernel x, y. Right, uh, by, by which I mean that if you apply Rv of Xi to F, what you get is Rv of Xi of Xy, F of Y, dy. And that's at, at F, at X, sorry. Okay, so we, we'd like to compute this object, the resolvent. And uh, to, to, to compute it, uh, what, what we need to solve in the sense of distributions is, so we want to solve minus dx squared plus v applied to rv of c of xy is delta of x minus y, right? So uh, I'm sorry, here there is a uh, minus xi.
right? So with the resolvent is the fundamental solution associated to the linear operator minus dx squared plus v minus uh, xi. So you see that uh, if y if if uh, y is different from x, then all we are actually solving is minus dx squared plus v minus xi applied to a certain function f equals zero. So that's just really a, an ODE problem. It's an ODE problem and it's a second order linear ODE. So it has a, a space of solutions, which is a linear space of solutions of dimension two. And so we need to uh, investigate it. And then if y equals x, uh, there is this jump condition uh, that in the first derivative, uh, which when you take two derivatives will give rise to this uh, delta. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm slightly abusing notations by writing uh, RV of C for the operator and its kernel. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. Yes, right, so RV of C is the resolvent and RV of C of XY is the kernel of the resolvent. Okay, so, uh, so there, there, are, there are sort of two, two points. Uh, what we're going to do is to first uh, apply this program in the case of uh, zero potential, so as to see uh, how things work for the, for the flat case. Uh, and then uh, we, we'll, we'll uh, look at what modifications have to be done to treat the, the case of a non-zero potential. And, and these modifications uh, are, are, are not so important and the fact that we deal first with the uh, zero potential case will make notations much simpler and will make everything more transparent. Okay, so our plan is to do this for the uh, flat case and then turn on the potential V and, and try to understand the solutions of the, uh, this ODE. Any, any questions? So the, the right? So right. So here, I, you mean this f here? Yes. Yes. So, so okay. Yes. Thank you for your question. So yeah, that's a yet another f. It is just saying that if y and x are are are, are different, then uh, the right hand side is zero here, and you're just trying to understand solutions of this ODE, and this f is maybe a g. I mean, it's just just meant to say that, okay, well, right? You, you just want to understand the ODE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the case V equals zero. So in this case, uh, we're looking at the operator uh, minus dx squared. And, and what we are going to do is, is to write this as 
the integral of lambda de lambda. But of course, we, we, we already know the answer. The answer is going to be provided by the, the Fourier transform, which, which achieves that if you write it in the, in the right way. Uh, so we want to apply Stone's formula. And to apply Stone's formula, uh, we need to write uh, the resolvent of uh, minus dx squared. So what, what, what is this uh, resolvent doing? It's doing minus dx squared. Right, minus lambda applied to uh, the resolvent RV. So that's the resolvent at uh, frequency lambda of xy. Okay, so this is rather the kernel of the resolvent. This should be a delta of x minus y. And here, uh, so lambda is a complex number. And square root of lambda is a C plus I eta. And so the sort of the difficult case is when uh, the real part of lambda is positive because uh, minus dx squared has positive spectrum. And so this means that Xi will be positive. At least we can choose Xi positive. And that's one of the determinations of square root of lambda. And uh, we take eta to be positive, which means that we are going to uh, converge the real, act to the real axis by the uh, upper half plane. Okay. so. It's, it's very easy to solve this equation here. So this equation. Uh, it's very easy because if x and y are different, then we're just looking at, at a solution of minus dx squared minus lambda applied to a function equal zero. And we know uh, the uh, solutions are given by complex exponentials. You have a complex exponential for x different from y, and at x equals y, you need to match uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side so as to get this uh, delta as a, as a result. So delta is the jump in the first derivative uh, because on the left-hand side, you have dx squared. Okay, so that's a computation that you can do. And what you find is that uh, r so there is no v here, it's r0. r0. Mm. Uh, so let me get the convention right. Right. r0 of lambda of xy is e to the i xi plus i eta x minus y. If uh, x minus y is positive, and same thing with a negative sign, if x minus y is negative. Right, so if, if, I, if I draw the graph, that's the graph. Uh, there is y, and then you have, uh, so it's, there is some decay away from y, and here there is a jump, so maybe it's like that, and there's a jump in the first derivative, something like that. Right, so this this gives the delta. I, I hope that's vaguely uh, 
helpful. Okay, so, so it's easy to compute uh, what the resolvent is, and I think it's correct. Um, modulo perhaps some sign errors. Uh, and then you can compute the limit as eta goes to zero of R naught of lambda of xy. And what you find is 1 over 2 ixe e to the ixe. And here you have the minimum of xy minus the maximum of xy. And so this is, this thing is r0 of lambda plus i naught of xy. And obviously you have a similar computation for r0 of lambda minus i naught of xy, which gives the same thing, 1 over 2 ixe, except you flip the sign here in the exponent. Uh, you have a question? Yes. Uh, so can you comment on the, uh, on the uh, fact that uh, you, you define the resolvent with lambda positive, but now you're taking uh, uh, so linear part positive, but now you're taking the limit from uh, negative imaginary Oh, here, here you mean? Right. Oh yeah, so here you need to redo the computation. So the, the computation we did was for this case. I see, so, so you do separately, uh, so okay. Yeah, and you have a... Have two branches, I thought that you, you choose a branch, but... Uh, no, no, so the computation is in this case, and then uh, there is a symmetric computation which okay, takes okay. care of this case. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, may I should erase a little bit. So how can I erase without making a mess? I'm not sure. So, okay, I have to erase everything. But we have these two formulas, which once again, you know, are, are, are straightforward computations. I mean, it's, it's complicated, but, uh, you know, there is nothing clever. Okay, so now we can apply Stone's formula, uh, which gives dE lambda is 1 over 2 pi i rv lambda plus i naught minus, or r0, I should say, r0 of lambda minus i naught. Uh, which, if you if you use the formulas that we just wrote, gives c over x e to the i x e x minus y 
minus e to the minus ixc x minus y. D lambda. And and so if you if you uh, unpack this, you get the uh, the classical formula that d e lambda. If you if I apply it to a function f, so I need to integrate in the y variable. Integrating in the y variable is going to be the same as taking the Fourier transform. Sorry, here uh, xi. There is no xi. Xi is square root of lambda, right? Right, so this is the same as c over xi. Integrating in y is taking the Fourier transform, so I get f hat of xi e i xi x. Uh, this is a plus here, plus f hat of minus xi. So if you project on the frequency uh, lambda, which is uh, c squared, right? You have, uh, and, and there is d lambda here. You get two contributions, one from the frequency plus xi and one from the frequency minus xi. Uh, and then since lambda is xi squared, there is this one over xi that, that comes from the Jacobian of the uh, change of uh, variable. The, the C is multiplicative in front of the parentheses, right? The, sorry? C, C of xi just factors out to... Oh, C, yeah. That's just... Uh, parentheses in this. Uh, oh, yes, here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and, and C is just because I, I don't want to keep track of constants. Okay, okay, very good. So, Well, it's sort of, if you want, the, it's like if I look at uh, 1 over uh, lambda plus i epsilon, as epsilon goes to 0, uh, it, it has a limit in the sense of distribution. So in the sense of distribution, there is going to be a, it's going to be principal value of 1 over lambda plus a constant times a delta function at zero, right? So it's a bit the same that's, that's happening. I mean, it's even exactly the same because if, if, you, if you look at the problem in the right um, coordinates, uh, the uh, operator becomes a multiplication operator and then it's, it's exactly these sort of things that you're looking at. So, so the limit, there is always a, a meaning in the sense of distribution. And if you subtract 1 over lambda minus i epsilon, only the, the delta remains. Yeah. I, is, it, is it helpful? OK. So, so now let's, let's move on to the case of a non-zero potential.
Okay, and so uh, I guess what, what we learned, well, what, what we need to, to understand uh, in addition to the zero potential case is just uh, how solutions of the ODE with the potential behave. And that's, uh, that's called uh, used solutions. So used solutions is a particular uh, basis of solutions of the problem uh, minus dx squared plus v f equals c squared f. Okay, so for now we take c to be real for uh, for for simplicity. But to, to do the whole argument, you need to allow uh, for a complex C and there, there are a few uh, modifications here and there. Uh, okay, so your solutions, they, they solve this ODE and you might say, well, it's just a, you know, uh, linear second order ODE, you know, what can happen? Uh, and actually the, the, the main uh, difficulty to understand is the behavior as a, uh, as C goes to zero, because uh, as long as C is um, as long as C is positive, uh, then uh, the, the, the 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 equation has an oscillatory behavior. Uh, if if you set V to zero, for instance, so far away from the origin. But if C goes to zero, you lose these oscillations, and, and new things happen. So it's sort of, it's sort of a singular limit. And, and the main problem is to understand, you know, what, what happens when C goes to zero. Uh, so the used solutions, they solve this equation and they have the following boundary condition. So there is one which is called F plus. Uh, which uh, is such that F plus of XC is equivalent to E I X C as x goes to infinity and there is one which is called f minus which is equivalent to e to the minus ixc as x goes to minus infinity so obviously that's just uh, you know sign conventions but what matters is that if i were to draw a picture so that's Uh, that's V, so V is a potential, that's X. And then if you look at F plus, you prescribe a certain uh, oscillatory behavior, so that's F plus. You prescribe a certain oscillatory behavior at plus infinity, and then you prolong the solution uh, to the left, and, and you see what happens when it crosses the potential, right? Or in physical terms, it's like a wave which is propagating in, uh, you know, in the absence of a potential and when it sees the potential, something happens. So the important thing is given by the uh, transmission and reflection coefficients. Uh, so here is the lemma. So if I look at F plus, so I'm going to write the lemma and then explain. F plus of XC. 1 over t of c f minus of x minus c plus r minus of c divided by t of c f minus of x c so this r is known as the uh, reflection coefficients and this t is known as the transmission uh, I, I will explain shortly what this terminology is about. Okay, so what are we doing here? So F plus, once again, it's defined to the, to the right of the potential. So F, F plus is defined to the right of the potential. And uh, what I should say, of course, is that uh, uh, f plus of x xi and f plus of x minus xi, so f plus of x xi and f plus of x minus xi form a basis 
of the uh, set of solutions uh, of this ODE. Right? It's just because it's a dimension two space and these two are, are linearly independent, so they form a basis of the set of solutions. Okay, are you assuming that V is uh, even in X? No, V doesn't have to be even. Uh, but uh, uh, and I haven't said anything about regularity. Uh, we assume that uh, V is, uh, say, in the Schwartz class. But everything would work if we were assuming that uh, it's in L1 with a weight. So y y you need uh, this. Uh, but V doesn't have to be even. There, there are simplifications when it is even. Um, yes, so what, what this equality is about, it's telling you if on the right you look like F plus, then on the left of the potential you want to, you want to uh, decompose F plus into uh, a sum of the two elements of the basis, F minus, and the coefficients are, are given in this manner. Uh, so it, written like that, it doesn't seem to be uh, the most natural way of writing things. But uh, it's uh, uh, this, this uh, T and R are, are natural objects. Um, and, and what's important is that the uh, so-called scattering matrix S of Xi, which is T of Xi, R plus of Xi, R minus of Xi, T of Xi, so this scattering matrix is unitary. And furthermore, uh, T of minus Xi equals T of Xi bar. Uh, so, okay, the fact that this, uh, the fact that you have such an equal, uh, yeah, and sorry, and there is a similar equality if you put F minus on the left hand side. So yeah, if you decompose F minus in terms of F plus, uh, I don't write it. And that's where the R plus uh, coefficient appears. Um, right. So the fact that this uh, equality holds is just due to the fact that F, F minus of X C, F minus of X minus C is a basis. Okay. So what's important is this relation on, on the coefficients first the unitarity of this matrix, and then these things about bar. Uh, but this can essentially uh, all be, uh, so proof, more or less, you need to use variants of the following argument. If I look at uh, W of, uh, say, F plus of X C, F plus of X minus C, so the Vronskian, uh, it's, it's independent of X, of course. And so you can evaluate it at plus infinity, at minus infinity. And you can do that with F plus, F plus, F minus, F plus, many combinations. And if you try them all, you get these relations on, on the uh, transmission and reflection coefficients. Uh, Okay, so now let me draw the, the picture that, that physicists draw, which is always sort of half mysterious to me, uh, but also half helpful. So I'm going to draw it.
Okay, so the physics picture. Here is the physics picture. So, okay, so that's space. We have our potential like that. And say you have an incoming wave, which is uh, F minus of, uh, maybe I should rewrite. So the formula that I just wrote, if you multiply out by uh, T of Xi, what you get is that a T of Xi times F plus of Xi is F minus of X minus Xi plus R minus of Xi divided by T of Xi. No, sorry, I multiplied out by T of Xi, so there is no T of Xi. F minus of X minus of X Xi. Right, so the incoming wave is this one, so that's the incoming. And that's F minus of X minus C. It's, it's hitting this potential. And then uh, you have part of the wave that goes through, and that's the transmitted wave. So it's uh, F plus of X C with the transmission coefficient T of C. And part of the wave bounces back, and so that's the uh, reflected wave. And uh, it's this one, R minus of C. F minus of X C. Okay, so, so you see this equality says that uh, uh, so let's say, right that this, this transmitted wave can be seen as the sum of the incoming and the reflected wave. And uh, furthermore, right, there is the conservation of energy. So conservation of energy tells you that the energy of the incoming wave is distributed between the reflected and the transmitted wave. So uh, that results in T of C squared plus R minus of C squared equals one. So it's like conservation of energy in this picture. And it's, it's part of the statement that the scattering matrix is unitary. Uh, so I, I think it's nice to have this but I have no clue how to make it rigorous uh, or how to think of it rigorously. If, if, you know, if, if you guys have a suggestion, I'd be, I'd be happy. Okay, so I in any case, uh, that's, I think, a nice way of, of thinking of this uh, reflection and transmission coefficients. Okay, so as I, was, as I was saying earlier, what matters is, is, or at least one important element, is the behavior of these reflection transmission coefficients as, as t goes to zero. And uh, so there are essentially two possibilities that go by the name of generic and exceptional uh, potentials. And uh, I will discuss these now, unless you have questions.
Okay, so uh, lemma. So the following assertions are equivalent. Uh, so first statement, t of 0. So t, remember, is the transmission coefficient. t of 0 equals 0. And the reflections, r plus minus of 0 equals minus 1. That's the first statement. And uh, when writing this down, uh, of course, you're going to tell me uh, how do you define t and r at 0 frequency. And indeed, there is a problem because uh, the f plus and f minus, if I let xi go to zero, they, 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 they don't uh, constitute a basis of, of solutions anymore because as xi goes to zero, both f plus of x, uh, sorry, there is just one f plus of x zero, which is one, on the, which is going to 1 as, as x goes to infinity. And so, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not a basis anymore. And so uh, the lemma that I stated doesn't really make sense if, if c is 0. But there is a way to show that uh, these have limits. So t and r have limits as c goes to 0. Uh, it's, it's not hard to see, and uh, okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm omitting it. So first statement, t is 0 and r is minus 1. Second statement, uh, there is no resonance at 0. What is a resonance, i.e., there doesn't exist a bounded non-zero solution of minus dx squared plus v phi equals zero. Uh, you know, so if, if either, hence both of these assertions are true, if, they, if these are true, v is called a generic, And otherwise, it's called exceptional. Are you assuming that V is positive or something like that? No, no, no. V is just real value, that's it. Uh, okay, so, uh, so maybe two remarks. So remark one, is that uh, if you take v equals 0, then uh, just uh, the function identically equal to 1 is a resonance. So the 0 potential is exceptional with this definition because it has um, bounded uh, non-zero solution of uh, dx squared f equals 0. OK. Uh, and remark two, uh, w w where does this terminology come from? Is it indeed the case that generically, a potential is generic, if, if you see what I mean? Right? So if you take a generic potential, why is there no resonance? Uh, so let me try to argue that this is the case. Um, So let's, right. let's say the potential is, is compactly supported. Right? The potential is compactly supported. So, and, and we look at the, at the equation minus dx squared plus v applied to f equals 0. So on the support of the potential, you know, we cannot say exactly what happens. But on the right of the spectrum of the potential, 
uh, a basis of solution of dx squared f equals 0 is provided by f equals 1 and f equals x. Right? That's clearly a basis of solutions. And on the left of the support of the potential, same thing, f equals 1, f equals x, uh, provide a, a basis of solutions. So now, what does it, what does it mean that the potential is, is, uh, is exceptional? So what does it mean that there is a resonance? It means that if you solve the equation with f equals 1 to the right of the potential, okay, then you solve through the potential, and then you see how it emerges on the left. So on the left, it's going to be a linear combination of f equals 1 and f equals x. And the only way that this thing is bounded is if the component on f equals x equals 0, which, of course, in general is not the case, right? And even generically, if you put f equals 1 on the left, what comes out on the right, sorry, what comes out on the left is a linear combination, a non-trivial linear combination of 1 and x. Um, and therefore, the thing is not uh, bounded and you don't have a resonance. So this terminology is, is indeed meaningful. Uh, generically, a potential is generic. Right? Did, 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 could, could you follow the discussion? Please, please let me know if, if I wasn't clear. Uh, so just a, a question, because what, what you said makes perfect sense for, for positive potential. But is it not the case that if you have a deep potential well, so negative and uh, deep enough, then, then you'll always have a bound state, and therefore uh, oh, generic, yeah. will not be generic? Oh, so, 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 so here, uh, this whole discussion is for... Right, uh, so, so, so the bound state will happen at a, at a specific frequency, right? So you need to add here a lambda, and, and you pick the lambda exactly so that it connects the, the stable manifolds on the right and on the left of the potential. But for most lambda, if you decay exponentially on the right, then you will blow up on the left. So there will be an exceptional lambda that will give you a, an eigenfunction or an eigenvalue. Uh, but most of this discussion was, was not, and, and this would be if you take uh, lambda to be um, positive, right? But most of this discussion is, is for lambda negative and, and maybe le letting lambda go to zero, in which case you have oscillatory behaviors on, on both ends. Does it make sense? So, so that would be, uh, okay, so there would be some fine tuning to have a zero eigenvalue or something like that. That would be it. Well, it's, it's not, you, you cannot have a zero eigenvalue, right? Because for the, for the free solution, it's going to be either 1 or x at infinity. So you cannot have a, uh, an eigenfunction in L2. That's not possible. The best if you can D, have... If D is negative, can you not? I mean, if D is negative and D is still not, can you not? No, because as soon as you exit the support of V, let's say V is uh, compactly supported for simplicity, okay, sure. mm -hmm. as soon okay. as you exit the... Right? So, so you need tail for, for, for what I'm saying. So for... for if you look at a zero eigenvalue, so lambda equals zero, right? As soon as you're away from the support of V, then your function is either constant or linearly growing. So it's never going to be in L2, but it can be in L infinity if it is properly tuned, which happens exceptionally. Well, it could be constant equal zero. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just, okay. I'm, I mean, of but if it's, if it's zero, I mean, it is, yeah. you're assuming compactly supported. Well, if it's not, then you need to have a small perturbation argument that works if V is decaying sufficiently fast. And I think okay. sufficiently fast is faster than 1 over x squared. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so le maybe let me not give a proof, but a caricature of a proof. So we start from the uh, formula T of xi 
f plus of x xi equals f minus of x minus xi plus r minus of xi f minus of x xi. Okay, and we let xi go to zero. So as xi goes to zero, as xi goes to zero, uh, okay, so which one do we want to assume? So t of xi goes to t of zero, that's for sure. F plus of xi, f plus of x xi goes to one, at least for x uh, much bigger than one. And this also goes to one for x much less than one. And same here. That's just by definition of the used solutions. Okay. So let's see, okay, how do I want to put it? Right. So if, say, let's do the uh, contrapositive. So if t of 0 is not 0, say, uh, then on the left-hand side, you have a function which is uh, bounded for x very, for x uh, much bigger than 1. And on the right-hand side, uh, you also have a function which is bounded, but this time for x much less than 1. So you see that in this limit, what you get is a uh, resonance. So it means uh, the limit, or ju let's just write it f plus of x 0 is a resonance. Okay, and you have a similar argument in the case where t of 0 is 0. Could you explain what you mean by x much less than 1? Do you mean x is very negative or is it just very Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, it's, it's rather uh, minus 1. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit of a, not a great notation. Yeah, x is very negative. So essentially, just thinking of the case where V is compactly supported, then you just need to be outside of the support. And otherwise, there is just a small uh, perturbative argument that you need to do. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what generic versus uh, exceptional potentials mean. Uh, and uh, the, f the fact that, uh, the, for instance, T is, is zero or not at zero, uh, we will have very uh, uh, remarkable consequences on the on the Schrodinger group. Uh, so it's it's not just a, you know technical uh, consideration. It it will be dynamically uh, very very relevant, and we'll come back to that next time. Uh, okay. So now we we have a good understanding of. Yost solutions, so we have a good understanding of uh, a good basis of solutions of the ODE. Now you can run the same argument as in the flat case v equals zero and get to define the distorted Fourier transform, which I will now do.
Yeah, can you say again what do you mean by, uh, what is the definition of a distorted Fourier transformer d was zero? So that was the third oh, yeah. measure. Right, no, so, so when v is zero is the regular, or maybe sometimes I say the flat Fourier transform, and it's distorted when you add a potential. And that's what we're going to define now. Okay, so distorted Fourier transform. Okay, so we, in, in the flat case for V equals zero, uh, of course the Fourier transform is defined through the complex exponential Eixc. And in the distorted case, uh, this becomes C of Xc which is defined as follows, 1 over square root of 2 pi times f plus of x c times t of c for c greater than or equal to 0 and f minus of x c x minus c, sorry times t of minus xi if xi is less than or equal to zero. And, and then you, you, you define uh, f tilde, so I denote it by a tilde, so a hat is for the flat case, and, hat, and tilde is when you add the potential, f tilde of xi is the integral of f of x, psi of x xi bar dx. Okay, and, and you, should, uh, you should really think of this as the analog of the flat Fourier transform, except that now it's, it's adapted to the case where there is a potential. Uh, so, okay, there, there are several possible definitions. Just like in the, in the case of the flat Fourier transform, you can use the complex exponentials as a basis, so it means at, uh, at frequency, so if you look at the eigenvalue c squared of minus dx squared, the eigenvalue c squared of minus dx squared has, has uh, a basis which consists of e i x c and e minus i x c. But you could just as well choose, uh, you know, sinus of x c and cosine of x c as a basis. Same thing here, you have several possible bases, but this one is, is good. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, 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 I'll try to explain why. Uh, so the, 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 the theorem, so you, know, you proceed just like in the flat case, you, you apply the spectral theorem and you use a Stone's formula. And the theorem that you get is that uh, so this uh, tilde operator, uh, let, let's call f tilde the distorted Fourier transform. So it's going to be unitary uh, on L2. Uh, oh, I, I should say uh, L2 so projected on the uh, continuous spectrum. But that's more of a, of a technicality, but you need to exclude uh, possible eigenvalues. So, okay, F tilde is unitary. And 
that's that just because uh, I've still, if you want, is the change of basis that uh, diagonalizes the operator. And since the operator is self-adjoint, the change of basis is uh, unitary. Uh, or to put it differently, it's because of the projectors that come up in the, uh, in the spectral theorem formulation. Okay, so F tilde also maps uh, L1 function to uh, continuous functions that decay at infinity. So this is very uh, reminiscent of the flat Fourier transform. Right. But now uh, there are differences, in particular if you're in the generic case, so in the generic case, if you look at uh, f tilde of zero, this is zero if f is in L1, uh, which of course is not the case in the flat case. That's, that's different from uh, the f regular Fourier transform, right? For the regular Fourier transform, a function does not necessarily have Fourier transform zero at uh, frequency zero. But in, gen in the generic case, it is the case uh, simply because uh, if you look at this formula uh, and you plug in uh, xi equals zero, what you get is t of zero. And when uh, in the generic case, t of zero is zero. So what you get is that the function p of x zero is zero. So there is just no way that uh, f tilde zero is something else. Okay, and finally, what we were, you know, looking for, uh, f tilde uh, diagonalizes minus dx squared plus v. In other words, if I look at minus dx squared plus v, I can write it as f tilde inverse times c squared times f tilde. And, and so for us, that's very important because it gives us a, a way of, of, uh, of decomposing a solution of the linearized problem around the soliton and of seeing, you know, at, at which speed its various components uh, oscillate. Okay, and, and the proof of this theorem, as I was saying, it's uh, just the spectral theorem and more specifically Stone's formula along with what we discussed about uh, Yost uh, functions. Okay, I, I think I will stop here for today. Next time we will see uh, applications of, of these ideas to um, to uh, the stability of, of solitons. Um, yes, that's going to be the, the plan. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, a couple of questions. So the first one is uh, the last statement uh, that you wrote uh, is um, as well as for the first, it refers to the absolutely continuous part of L2, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to, to have this sort of diagonalization, you have to take into account the eigenvalues, right? Yes. So one can do that. Okay. And so the other question is, uh, maybe you, 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 you partially answered before, so what is the exact, uh, an exact, let's say, uh, hypothesis on the potential in order, in order for this theory to hold? Right, so what you need is xv to be in L1. xv to be in L1. And essentially, here is the reason why. So you look at minus dx squared plus v. Right, minus dx squared plus v. 
Okay, and all of this is going to work when the uh, dx squared part will be, you know, dominant over the potential part. Uh, so now, sort of scaling-wise, what does it mean? Well, minus dx squared is like uh, two derivatives of x, obviously, and it scales like minus. It scales like one over x squared, right? Minus dx squared. It scales like one over x squared. So if v decays sl faster than one over x squared, the minus dx squared part is going to uh, take over, and otherwise, perhaps not. So uh, one way of seeing that v decays faster than one over x squared is to ask that the integral of x v dx is finite. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, if not, I will uh, I will see you next week. And uh, thank you for your attention uh, today. And uh, see you next week then. Bye bye. Salut, à la semaine prochaine.